G'day everyone and welcome to the Energy Year podcast. Dr. G bringing you another hour or so of the discussions that matter at a price you can afford. And today I am joined by Angela Passarelli. Angie is Director of Research at the Institute of Coaching at the McLean Harvard Medical School, as well as an Associate Professor of Management at the College of Charleston, where she teaches management and organizational behavior. Her research and other academic work has been published in outlets such as the Leadership Quarterly, the Journal of Management Education, Social Neuroscience, and the Consulting Psychology Journal, and she has made scholarly contributions to a variety of subdisciplines and topics, including organizational neuroscience, leadership development, emotional intelligence, experiential learning, and behavior change. As a coaching researcher, Angie has studied the efficacy of coaching interventions for unique demographic groups, such as female entrepreneurs, new working mothers, and physicians, and she serves as a representative at large on the board of the Organizational Neuroscience Division at the Academy of Management. Angie also serves as a research fellow with the Coaching Research Lab and as an instructor of executive education at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University, where I had the pleasure of making her acquaintance and working alongside her. And so without further delay, Angie, beaming in from the beautiful Palmetto State in the deep, deep south. I can practically smell the Spanish moss through the airwaves. Welcome to the Energy of Podcast, and thank you so much for making the time to be with me today. Thanks, Gareth. It's a pleasure to be here. Real pleasure to have you here, Angie. And so I want to start our conversation today by just saying first how much I love what I do for a job. So as a coach, I really have found my feet, professionally speaking. I love working with people to help them help themselves become happier, become more fulfilled, become more energetic, become more focused. I love working with people to help them steer themselves into exciting new career paths or build more resonant relationships or get into better physical and emotional shape. I love what I do. And the reason I mention all of this is because you are someone who is pretty intimately familiar with the latest developments in this work that I love doing so much. You've conducted and you've overseen research on coaching. You're the director of research, as I mentioned uh, during the introduction, at an affiliate institution of you know, one of the world's most prestigious schools. You've published and spoken in various fora on this topic and in the space extensively. All told, you really are someone whose resume and bona fides and coaching make you a legitimate authority on the subject and someone whose perspectives on it uh, carry real weight in my eyes. And so I've been immensely looking forward to speaking with you and getting some of your reflections and insights on all things coaching. And so I thought a good place to start is just to get your own high level take on the general landscape of coaching and coaching research as it stands two months into the year 2023. Just, just from your own personal individual point of view, what is the state of scholarship like right now in coaching? Do we, do we have good grounds, increasingly good grounds perhaps to continue promoting or perhaps even expanding on coaching as an effective inter, uh, intervention for individuals and organizations? What's your, what's your current view of the state of play in coaching and perhaps what has you, what has you personally most excited with respect to the latest research in coaching? Well, thank you first for your kind words in that opening. Gareth, I feel like I need you in my house in the mornings to give me a pep talk about what I'm doing every day. I can see why you're a good coach. And I, I really, you know, I love, like you, I love my work. I love sitting at the intersection of both practice and research. And, and, and I love coaching too, but my passion really is to build the scientific foundation for this field. And I think that we've come a long way in terms of the scholarship and the research and the science. We are, we're probably still toddlers. I think we've moved on from infancy <laughs> to the toddler stage. And we've, pro we've made the most strides really in, in documenting the outcomes of coaching. And you know, as you mentioned, do we have solid ground to stand on? I, I think we're, there've been a number of randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard in intervention research that demonstrate that coaching does work, so to speak, uh, in terms of helping people do, achieve many of the things that you just mentioned in your introduction, you know, increase their well-being, decrease their burnout, enhance their leadership capabilities, their self-efficacy. We have 
a number now of interpretive meta-analyses and sort of sy systematic reviews published in high-level journals. And since you mentioned where we are today in 2023, it was just recently, I don't know if you've seen it, an article that came out in the Academy of Management, Learning and Education, which is one of the top journals in our field by Eric Dahan and his colleagues that is a, a, qual a quantitative meta-analysis of 37 RCTs on workplace leadership coaching. Uh, and that, again, gives us more confidence. You know, I never would say we have proof per se, but a lot more confidence that it works. Yeah, right. I, I actually literally just before I got on the on the line with you, I saw the the link to that Dahan article. So I haven't read it yet, but tremendously excited to see the results. The, you know, what I saw, what I gleaned of the abstract that will, will look very, very encouraging. But you and I both uh, cut our teeth as coaches using the intentional change theory framework. It was initially developed uh, by our mutual friend, Richard Boyatzis. I, I, I've spoken on this podcast previously about this model with Lauren Dyke and, and, and Alan Van Osten. But I want to turn to uh, turn our attention to a paper you co-authored with Alan and with Sarah Moore in uh, the consulting psychology journal that was published last year entitled How Leaders and Their Coaches Describe Outcomes of Coaching for Intentional Change. I wonder if you might just summarize the major findings, the major implications of this research and also if you might address a specific concern that was raised early in the paper, uh, where you and your co-authors state, quote, not specifying the theoretical underpinning of coaching processes makes it difficult to draw inferences about why coaching did or did not produce the desired results. So does intentional change theory specifically help us better understand the why behind the efficacy of coaching? And do you think such an improved understanding of the why, if so, uh, in coaching can in turn better help us coaches understand the how of coaching, the application of coaching? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there was a lot packed in that statement. Let me, <laughs> let me see if I can cover most of it. The piece that you referred to in CPJ was at risk of contradicting myself about the gold standard. <laughs> was an opportunity to, to not impose outcome criterion on leaders who have gone through coaching process. And so rather than giving them a quantitative scale of something we thought would change, we asked them to articulate in their own words, you know, what if anything, knowing that for some people, coaching doesn't have the impact we intended to have. What if anything has been the most important outcome of coaching. And then we qualitatively coded those responses into thematic buckets. A couple of things came out of that. I mean, there were a number of, of what we would expect to see, you know, I've gained self-confidence. I've, you know, had created time for reflection, you know, slow down in my life. I have built my you know, self-management skills, my social management skills. But some of the, the ones that were most important and came out most frequently were that they, and we can talk about this later, you know, part of the intentional change theory, which was the framework we were coaching which is, with is to develop this ideal self. So some people described that vision work as being one of the most important and tangible things they walked away from the coaching process with. And we often, you know, as researchers, we were a little bit surprised to see that because we thought, gosh, that's just a mechanism by which we achieve the outcomes. But for these folks, really internalizing this new sense of self as you know an aspirational version of self in the future was important and tangible. And so I think that I would want to highlight that from that study. Another piece of the work that was important was that we learned that people don't really see themselves enacting change, at least not as early as their coaches do. So coaches who answered the same question said, these folks are enacting change right after coaching ended. But it took seven and a half months for that to emerge as a really strong outcome in the eyes of the, the people being coached themselves. And so, you know, that was a, another implication for both research and practice. You know, when do you survey folks about the outcomes and assess them on what, what's really happening in coaching? So if you're going to ask them about change, don't do it right after the last session. Let it sink in for a little while. Let them do the work. And so to your point about needing a theoretical foundation, I would not feel confident in saying that every coaching process has an outcome of helping people see themselves in the light of possibility, you know, helping them create a vision for themselves. Because this particular coaching intervention 
you know, held that as part of, of the process. And the coaches are trained to, to not only help people cultivate that sense of the ideal self and personal vision, but also to weave it in through the entire coaching engagement so that it's not just a checkbox, you know, one and done, we finished this. And so had we not specified what that theoretical foundation was for the coaching framework, we wouldn't really be able to say why or where this particular outcome came from. And I wouldn't feel confident saying that it would happen with every coaching approach. So if you don't emphasize the ideal self, we don't know if vision and this new sense of self would emerge as an important outcome. And so you know, to me, the theoretical, the, this point that we made in the article about in our research, we need to specify what the theoretical foundation is. You know, what is the coaching process that's going on so that we can begin to attribute outcomes to mechanisms and processes in the research? Right. And I'll, I'll return to the same article in just a moment, but just, just as useful as, and, and, and I agree, it's, it's super useful. I, I actually, you mentioned the word tangible before. I think the great thing about ICT is it actually really makes vision seem tangible rather than wishy-washy or wafty or Pollyanna-ish. And there's a good, uh, it gives good theoretical substance to why that is. I think that some, in some coaching frameworks try to conceive of something like the ideal self, but in many ways it comes off as like the unimaginable self, or as mm. we've often spoke about in, in, in ICT, the ought self, you know, other people's conceptual exactly. vision for, for who you are. But, 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 but setting that aside just for now, I mean, as useful as the ICT framework is for coaching, in your view, are there any other theoretical frameworks that you think bear mentioning as being valuable for determining that why, the, the theoretical underpinnings behind effective coaching? I mean, are, are there sort of complementarities between different theoretical frameworks and coaching? And I mean, if so, what are some of the other theories that you think are the most uh, germane in this regard? Yeah, I think I think there's a number of theories that, that apply to coaching and that can intertwine with ICT really nicely. But the one I personally have done the most work on and really see also in my coaching practice is self-determination theory. And here I would draw heavily on what promotes intrinsic motivation that allows people to sustain their change efforts over time? And it comes back to the, the coach and the coachee and the process of their work together, being able to fulfill those coachees' fundamental needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Yeah, I, I, I think SDT is just, it's proven itself so durable over the years. Like it feels like uh, with, with not just in coaching research, but in all kinds of you know, management and organizational behavior related research, it feels like the, the evidence to support SDT is just sort of like piling on more and more. It's really one of those theories that's just found, you know, an increasing, you know, just flurry of riches of, of, of empirical support, which is fantastic because it's quite old now, right? I mean, the original, I mean, 85 or so, it's got to be close to 40 years old now at some point, at this point, right? When you say it like that, <laughs> yeah, I probably, you know, I don't know when the, I, I, I don't actually know when the kind of seminal pieces of self-determination theory came out, but I would imagine that to be the case. And gosh, yeah, 40, right. 40 well, years I, feels like a long time. <laughs> it does, right? I mean, it, but, but, it, but I agree. I mean, I think there's great complementarity between those two frameworks. And maybe just to sort of as, as, a, as a side point, Carol Kaufman, I know, who knows a, a colleague of yours, she's uh, spoken in the past about this idea of model agility and coaching. And some people refer to it as technical eclecticism, sort of this idea that rather than wedding yourself as a coach practitioner, rather than wedding yourself to any one theoretical framework, sometimes it's, you know, it's useful and, and, and uh, applicable to certain coaching clients if you actually sort of borrow elements from each and kind of mold them into this, you know, flexible array of different you know, co co coaching foundations and so forth. So what, what, what do you think about that? What, what do you think about the idea that as a coach, depending on the client, you kind of have to shape shift between, you know, maybe an ICT foundation, but then bring in some Gestalt at some point and then some SDT at another point and other framework. What do you think generally about the idea that coaches should have, you know, a, a pretty wide variety of theoretical frameworks uh, in their toolkit to draw from? Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. I think that that helps. It helps coaches meet clients where they are, so to speak, and be responsive. So, you know, keeping a few fundamental theoretical approaches in mind as you go through the practice is important, but then pulling in your toolkit, you know, to decide what this person needs at this moment. Uh, and maybe it's 
gestalt, maybe it's somatic coaching, maybe some breath work is going to change the nature of the conversation. So, you know, I, I think the difference between this is where difference between practice and research comes into play, because in practice, you're really fluid and flexible in terms of how and when you draw on this repertoire of ideas and theories. But in order for us to scientifically, scientifically test some of those things, we've got to tease them apart and do them one at a time in a, in a way, you know, to really understand what's going on and how they're best applied and used. And so I think there could be a, a competing message there, if you hear me say on one hand, isolate and test versus in practice, you know, isolate and test in research and then in practice, integrate. Yeah, I don't think that's, some people that might seem contradictory, but I, I don't see the contradiction there. I, I think that, so, you know, the, the practice of science involves isolation and, and, yeah. and teasing apart different variables and different strands. And then when you're actually doing it on the fly in the context of a coaching session, you neither have the benefit nor the incentive nor the need to isolate in quite the same way that you need to for, you know, methodical systematic scientific research yeah. so yeah i i don't see a con maybe some people do but i i personally don't see a con contradiction there or a, an incoherence there but just just go, go back to that same article the cpj article one, one of the most uh, important nuggets of wisdom that i that i found in this article was this idea that um or this finding that increased self-awareness was the most frequently reported outcome by leaders and their coaches and so there's a direct quote from the article that states that leaders uh, suggested that coaching provided an, op uh, an important opportunity to pause and reflect on their present situation. And this is a biggie for me and my coaching practice, because it feels like in the absence of an intervention like coaching, most people have really no dedicated opportunity in their lives or careers for actual purposeful reflection and personal contemplation. Most people just go through their day thinking without knowing that they're thinking, mm -hmm. you know, uh, being without really being aware that they are being. I'm, I'm not trying to get too cosmic about this or anything, but as a result, they're often, you know, they're often operating their auto, uh, careers on autopilot, their lives on, on autopilot, How, however otherwise successfully they are doing things on autopilot. And so I wonder if you might just sort of expand a little on this importance that you found in your research that leaders attribute to this, to this reflective self-awareness and, you know, perhaps whether more people could benefit from having that kind of, call it a circuit breaker in their otherwise on autopilot conception of themselves. Yeah, I, I would say it's on autopilot conception and also with a bias for action. You know, we do all the time, but very, very rarely do we slow down. And it, with a coach, when you're working with a coach, you're incentivized to pause and slow down and engage in contemplation. And what we found is that we, we actually coded reflection and self-awareness differently. So reflection was when individuals said, I had it, just what we've been saying really, I had a chance to slow down. I had a chance to pause and to think. I had a chance to, sometimes they use the word reflect. And for some of them, they continued doing that even after the coaching process was over and just embedding more white space in their calendar for time to think and pause or just to take a walk, even if it's for 15 minutes down the hallway that you don't gonna be interrupted where you can, you can just reflect. The self-awareness theme was different. We coded that when someone said, I have new self-insight about who I am today versus you know, if it was who I want to be in the future, it was coded as vision. And so that the self-awareness piece was for, as you said, for both the coaches and the coachee. So that just in case those of your audiences listening has not read the paper, we also asked the coaches, you know, what if anything was the most important outcome of coaching for your coachee? You know, do you believe was the most important outcome? And so we compared those. And for both of them, the most frequently occurring insight was they've discovered something new about who they are. And oftentimes it's something, almost always, that something new was something positive. Uh, you know, they saw themselves and their capabilities in a way that they hadn't seen before. And sometimes it was, oh, I, <laughs> I see now that I'm doing that and it's not serving me well and I need to make a change. Uh, but the self-awareness piece yeah, is absolutely important. 
isn't that so amazing as well that you know like like some of the i mean certainly for me some of the most gratifying break breakthroughs that i have with with, with coaches is when they not only discover something you know positive about themselves it's worth aspiring towards but they kind of for the first time in many ways for a lot of people discover that they even have that capacity to mm-hmm. be positive and be aspirational about themselves we're not talking here about people who are clinically mentally ill or um, suffering from depression or anything like that we're actually just talking about regular everyday people who probably have a fairly you know level emotional uh, a baseline of emotional stability but they've never had an intervention which prompted them to think about themselves in more lofty visionary terms before they just never had occasion to sort of sit and think well, you know, like not only do it, do I possibly deserve better, but I can achieve better. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, like like co- coaching really is one of the master interventions to help bring that consideration out of people, you know, a consideration that they hadn't, you know, perhaps hitherto pondered. Right, exactly. And I think even even if it's not something positive, I think the coaching relationship and that container that is created between two people who are, you know, engaging in this growth process from a place where there's, you know, just true trust and respect and care for one another creates a place where I can see the dark sides of me, but in a way that doesn't tear me down. You know, to say, gosh, I want to be someone who gives other people voice. But geez, in those meetings, I am using my voice more than I'm using my ears to listen to other people, you know, not giving voice. And so, you know, to get that insight, that self-awareness of, gosh, I'm not showing up the way that I want to show up, but to have it be in the context of a journey toward possibility instead of in a punitive kind of environment of evaluation and judgment, it just, it it changes the insight. It changes how, it changes the awareness that comes from the realizing those things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there can be a corrective aspect to coaching without being a correctional aspect to coaching. I realize that 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 perhaps sounds like a distinction without a difference to some people or, you know, me playing a semantic game, but, you know, you, you wouldn't undertake the process of coaching if there wasn't something you were trying to improve or correct. But I think people take that and they run with it too far and kind of think, well, if it's a process of correction, then by definition, there's something defective about me. When really the process of uh, making some, you know, correcting something doesn't imply that what was already there was bad, right? It might need improving, it might need working upon, it might need enhancing, but the substrate and the foundation that's already there might actually, and, you know, in my experience, usually is actually already pretty good. You know, I, I think this is this is again where vision is so important because vision is just a super stimuli that allows people to sort of cast their mind beyond merely treating defects and actually looking at, like you said, possibilities. You know, what what is actually out there in the world for me to achieve? Not just having my problems diagnosed and fixed mm-hmm. and solved, but what are the answers? Uh, what, what are the puzzles in my life that I could seek answers to? What are the discoveries in my life that I could happen upon? And I, I think, again, yeah, that's where the vision piece is just so important. So I'd like to steer us now toward uh, another great paper that you co-authored and published recently. Uh, and shout out again to Alan Van Osten, as well as our friends uh, Mandy Barley and Mai Trin, who also contributed uh, to the paper. This one in the journal Human Resource Management and entitled Communication Quality and Relational Self-Expansion, The Path to Leadership Coaching Effectiveness. I'm going to ask about relational self-expansion in a minute, Uh, but first I wondered if you might comment on the communication quality aspect of this paper. So in concluding the paper, you and your co-authors quote, results provide some certainty that leadership coaching can be successfully delivered at a distance via telephone or video conferencing. And, and, and part of the, uh, the, uh, the basis for the study was trying to determine if face-to-face coaching had greater efficacy than Skype or Zoom-based coaching and so forth. And so this has obviously been a big consideration for coaches over the last uh, few years, particularly in 2020, 2020 and 2021, where we often had no choice but to coach remotely. Um, And my understanding is that, you know, quite a bit of the data that you all collected for this research was obtained prior to the pandemic, although although please do correct me if that's wrong. 
and so I wonder if you were to repeat this study in the, you know, in this kind of quasi post pandemic world, we now found, uh, find ourselves in, do you think the results would hold up much the same? Because just for me, anecdotally, at least, it seems that a lot of co- for a lot of coaches, people have actually gotten a bit sick of Zoom coaching, like the pandemic turned many coaches off remote coaching in general. And, you know, it feels like, again, anecdotally, there's now been kind of a renewed clamor for in-person coaching and that people also feel like they get better results from the face-to-face touch. So, um, and I don't realize this is kind of, you know, speculating here, perhaps, but do you think, you know, those particular findings in, in the article would still hold up? If you were to sort of like like rerun the data, you know, based on more recent data, or that you know, it, d- distance coaching might actually be less amenable to successful delivery in the post pandemic era, or is it maybe too 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 early to tell too yeah. too too soon since the you know the kind of call at the end of the pandemic to tell? Yeah. Well, we we've learned. Well, my first speculation is that at a high level, even post pandemic, I don't think we would see substantial differences. But I think there's nuance that we haven't understood yet. And so part of that nuance would be perhaps there are particular points in the coaching process where being face-to-face is advantageous. So maybe that initial meeting for rapport building purposes. For Honestly, this is a little bit provocative yeah. and I've always wanted to do this research but haven't been able to figure out how. I think the aspect of physical touch is an important element of human relationships. And so that initial handshake, that, you know, a, a, touching a forearm or a shoulder during a, a difficult part of the conversation, you know, if you see the client welling up in tears, it's hard as the coach on the other end to not really be able to reach out to that person. And so, you know, there may be times when being in person would be an advantageous. There may be other times, you know, the first time that you look at 360 degree feedback, for example, with a client. It could be that that is harder to deliver in person, not to deliver, not for the coach, but harder to receive in person for the coachee than than other kinds of conversations or even, you know, unpacking what that means in a subsequent conversation. Maybe the unpacking part could be face to face, but the actual debrief and delivery of here's how to interpret the results and here are your results might be better done at a distance. We don't know. So I think if we were to do the research again, I would want to spend more time theorizing about when it's important to be face to face and when it's not. I, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think that there, there is a lot more nuance to it. I think that there perhaps, I, I actually hadn't thought of the 360 um, feedback example before, but I think that's actually, that's a really good case of where the impersonal touch might actually be more efficacious because, I mean, I've been, you know, back when I was studying a case, I saw those MBA classes where people were getting their first 360 degree feedback, you know, reports for the first time. And it was just like, you know, trying to walk them through these results in person. It was often just that this, you know, obstacle course of, you know, emotional messes. And yeah, it it felt like, man, if I I was was able to deliver that news or deliver those uh, results, impersonally, it would have actually stripped a lot of unnecessary emotion out of the process. And that might have given them a better, you know, a better building basis to, you know, to, to move on using that feedback. Um, but, but I also, you know, share the same concerns about not being in someone's presence. I think there's maybe, this, this is maybe getting out into the weeds a little bit here, but I also think maybe at a subconscious level, things like um, you know, olfactory considerations like sense of smell and, 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 and things like that. Um, eye movement, you know, just even, even the way that I look at someone or the way that I smile or, you know, my like micro facial movements. I, I feel that, and, and, and I'm, I'm certainly speaking out of school here because I'm, I'm no expert, but I feel like when I'm coaching over Zoom, even, you know, my facial expressions, are those of a disembodied avatar as opposed to a human being. And that when I'm actually in a a room with someone, you know, that they're getting the warts and all version of me. And for many people, that's, you know, that's particularly appealing in a coach, having that very, very deeply personal in-person touch. Yeah. So, and this is a perfect segue to what my also is going to be, because I think the also piece of what I would study if we were to do that again is to actually look at just phone versus video. 
So there's some evidence to suggest that, especially for novice listeners who you know aren't trained to pick up emotional cues, that empathetic listening is actually improved when you don't have visual data, where all you have is audio data. So you know if you think about that from a, you know if you give coaches enough credit to call them experts, it shouldn't matter for the coach. But I also think that you know this is a relationship, and even though the coach is the one sort of facilitating the process. The coachee is picking up emotional cues and sending emotional cues also from the coach. And so it might be totally. that for, you know, if you think about it from a dyadic point of view, a telephone might be a better option. Also, we've learned a lot about Zoom, uh, you know, Zoom fatigue. And some of this research came out even before there was Zoom that there are a lot. So as good as Zoom is, it violates a number of social norms. So, for example, uh, social distance. Depending on where people are sitting away from their camera, it could appear that the sort of shape of my face, the distance between my eyebrows and my nose is, is the equivalent of interacting with an intimate partner. That's not a right. normal work relationship. We stand <laughs> farther away right. from the, you know, and so that alone creates a little bit of dissonance. There's issues with eye gaze. So even if we're, so let's take the 360, for example. Say we're both looking at an electronic document of that 360. If we were face to face, we might be looking at a piece of paper that, you know, on a desk between us, or we each have our own version and we're looking down. When we're looking at a digital 360, we are both gazing at the computer screen, which makes it look like we're not breaking our eye gaze, which is very unnatural in social communication in general, but certainly for instances like that. And so it's a subtle, violation of social norms that is fatiguing, you know, and, and it can infect us. You know, I think it's why people are sort of starting to say, you know, I'm done with Zoom. Let's just get together in person or let's have a phone conversation. Yeah, I, I mean, two, two things bubbled up for me there. One, just the fact about, you know, the, the putative advantage of audio only coaching. I, I, I know this kind of sounds uh, a little bit silly, but sometimes a face is very distracting whatever that face is you know it's not it doesn't it doesn't have to be an, an appealing looking face or or you know just a, re a regular face um you know again at a subconscious level people's facial movements can influence our downstream psychology and so you know i think there's something to be said about audio coaching audio only coaching taking that variable out of the equation and, and, and just to your point as well about you know it goes the other way because it's dyadic you know, that makes me mindful, you know, or would make me mindful, I think, of, you know, how is my face coming across in this coaching interaction? I, I'm also mindful of the fact that, like, I'm a big guy. And so, you know, particularly with a new coaching client, if I'm working with them for the same time, I might be kind of like an imposing presence. You know, I, I, I don't suspect that's true for the majority of my clients who probably don't even notice. But I think for some people, certainly, you know, someone's physical stature or something like their face or whatever could you know, not, not, not necessarily interfere in a significant way with the coaching process, but it could have subtle impacts. So that's kind of an interesting thing to ponder. Uh, and the other thing that, that came up for me was just, yeah, the, the, the weirdness and the kind of the uncanniness and the sort of weirdly non-human-like qualities that come through in a Zoom call sometimes. You know, I've had, you know, clients who've had to have their session with me for whatever reason on their phone and it had you know for whatever reason they can't position their phone in a suitable place at a suitable angle and so like you're, you're staring up their nose the whole time <laughs> or like you're staring down at their forehead or whatever and you know a, you know a good coach uh to a point kind of you made earlier i mean a good coach a professional will kind of work through that in some sense but you do have to be more mindful of it you get as a coach when you're, you're being focused and actively listening and so forth it can be a little bit harder when you're staring at someone's nose hairs or staring like at their eyebrows at an unusual angle or something. So I think even though Zoom has, I mean, certainly, you know, like I, I, I would hate to see the end of Zoom and it, it's been a, a fantastic innovation uh, for our practice, but it has also sort of, I think, brought into stark relief some uncannily unhuman-like qualities in the people that we observe in our coaching practice and that we dialogue with in our coaching practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, for me, you know, I don't think we know a whole lot from a research perspective yet, but from a practice perspective, my thought is, you know, 
just always make intentional choices. We default easily to kind of what is practical, but sometimes that's not the most important driver. You know, thinking purposefully about the choice of medium is is important for coaches. And I don't think many coaches well, sure. take that into account to the level that they should. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there should be more of an awareness there. I, I think maybe some coaches have, you know, and possibly the pandemic has kind of spurred this on, but I think some of them have sort of defaulted to the convenience of Zoom without taking into consideration the fact that Zoom is kind of a, you know, less than perfect representation of a, you know, coaching engagement. It's, it's, it's not to say, you know, like, like to, 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 to the findings of your research, it's not to say that it undermines the effectiveness of coaching itself, but it is, you know, it, it, it really is a different way of coaching in many ways. It's a different way of applying your coaching practice. So something that people need to be mindful of anyway, I think I, I agree that awareness is, is a big part of that. But I just want to go back again to the, the, the human resource management paper and this concept that you and the rest of the blue CWRU team to, uh, termed relational self-expansion. Um, so I found this, 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 this construct very, very interesting. Could you tell us what relational self-expansion is and uh, perhaps describe how predictive it is uh, of an effective coaching relationship? So relational self-expansion is personal growth that comes from an intertwining with another person. And this idea came from kind of two places. One, a reaction to very popular conceptualizations of the coaching relationship as a working alliance, which tends to really weigh heavily on, you know, do a task and goal aspects of the relationship and, and not much in the actual relationship itself. It also comes from work in relational cultural theory that suggests that, particularly for women, women grow in connection with other people. And this idea of relational self-expansion is based on the idea that a coach and a client, a coachee, have to be in emotional attunement with one another, and they need to be responsive to one another and open to being impacted to one another. And I think it's kind of a slightly radical way to think about the coach as being willing to be impacted by the coachee. So it changes this dynamic of coaching as something you do to someone to coaching is something that you do with someone that I think is more actually better aligned to coaching practice and where the power dynamic is more equal between two parties, where it's not a coach who has a skill set and information to impart, but rather a coach, a person being coached and a coach who come together in a co-creative, generative and power balanced process. And so this idea of relational self-expansion is the idea that in a coaching process, the coach grows along with the coachee. Yeah, and that's and that's been my experience. Mm -hmm. That that's been my experience, and, and it's been. I think the more that you diversify your clientele, your coaching clientele, the more relational self expansion has to offer you as a coach. You know, the the, the more people that you can expand your conception of yourself in relation to, the more different people with different backgrounds and different experiences and so forth. You know, it is going to have a transformative influence on you. You know, it's, it certainly has on me. Like I, I, I coach people from so many different walks of life, uh, such a big part of, um, and, and you know, you'll know this better than anyone, such a big part of making a coaching relationship work is about chemistry and rapport and trust and bonding. And just, you know, again, the, the kind of, there's obviously a clinical professional aspect to the work that we do as well, but there's also a very, very human centered dimension to it and what i just loved about this construct is i really think it brought those human qualities home you know the fact that it, it, i think some people think that you know you're either a friend or you're in a professional engagement and that there's no kind of shades of gray in human interaction but all human interaction is shades of gray like that like in fact with with some clients they've either said to me or i've made the remark that our work together really in many ways is a friendly conversation. It's, it's, a, it's a friendly conversation with a purpose and it's, you know, steered to, you know, hopefully in the direction of you achieving what you want to achieve and everything. It's a, it's a vehicle for achieving that. But the, you know, to the degree you're going to have a bond and you're going to have rapport, it's better to make that bond and that rapport real, not just an artifact of the job, like, like, like something that's actually like for real, substantive on a human level. And I, I would probably argue that that 
substantive on a human level relationship is as important to coaching outcomes as any of the other configurations, even the ideal self. Because I don't think that you can really get to the ideal self completely and safely without that kind of a relationship in place. Right. And, and, and is that why we importantly have resonant relationships, discovery number, phase number five of the ICT model? Yeah, you're right. Well, you know, so you said that and I, I wanna go back and maybe qualify what I said a little bit because I think Although resonant relationships is discovery number five, it's interconnected with all of the other discoveries. And sure. I actually think that, you know, I, I said previously that the relationship, you can't develop an ideal self without that relationship in place. And I, I don't, I actually think maybe that's a miscommunication because what that translates to in practice is that we have to do all this rapport building before we get to the, you know, work of, uh, of the coaching process or the intentional change theory process. And, and actually, I think that that relationship emerges from working on the ideal self together. And, and you know, it's not just, okay, we have, to, we have to have this rapport and chemistry first, and then we can do this work. It's actually kind of a, a product that occurs and deepens because of the process, not before the process. And that is the human-centered way of doing it, right? I mean, it's like developing friendships. It's not, it's not like you start with, okay, we're going to be friends, so we have to have this like baseline level of rapport yep. and trust before we get underway with this friendship. Or, you know, that, that, that would be crazy, right? So, but, it, but you know, it totally applies in, in, in the coaching realm, even, even if it is, you know, a professional and, you know, even, even though we, we do it in a professional and clinical way, I just think that that, that human framing as, as the starting, you know, and not, not, you know something that you, you, you said co-created before, like, like that, that process of co-creating the relationship together, that's a real human process, right? Like, 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 like building a friendship or building even intimate relationships and so forth. They follow similar dynamics, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant process of co-creating this entity, which you are both bonded with it together. So yeah, I mean, I just, that, that, that construct has landed with me so much. So, you know, very, very happy to see that, see that cashed out in the paper. Is really cool. So just a couple more questions, Angie. This one is maybe may out in the weeds a little bit, so it might be kind of a little little hot takey, but we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll get your, your, your high-level impressions of it. Something that's been on uh, a lot of people's minds lately is ChatGPT. <laughs> it's this artificial intelligence chatbot that's been helping people write books, um, cheat on their homework. I, I, I've literally seen my students in my Man 101 class sitting there just using it. And I still don't know how to think about it, but that's a topic for a different day. You know, people are getting the chat GPT to do their whole day's work for them, etc. So bring this to coaching. I'm interested to know if you've reflected at all on the potential impact technology of this sort could have on the coaching profession. I mean, I know it's fairly straightforward to make the case for the human touch in coaching. We've just been you know, speaking about that. But I wonder if for some potential clients, some people that might otherwise avail themselves of our services, ChatGPT might be capable of providing all the essentials they need for their development without the expense or the need to dialogue with an actual human being. So again, just m maybe high level, hot takey. What do you kind of think of that proposition? I mean, e even if this technology isn't a threat to coaching at large, do you think it might have some kind of transformative impact on how we practice and perhaps think about coaching? Yeah, well, I think with any technology, especially in the digital world that we live in, we have to think of how they can not compete with us, but rather how we can use them as a tool and you know, just add them to the repertoire. And so I think with chat GPT and other forms of AI, it has, the potential to streamline some of our work. Do I think it's gonna replace an in-person coach? No. Do I think that it might help to democratize coaching for folks who can't afford or for whatever reason don't have access to a coach? Possibly, I mean, maybe. But I, I think where we are right now, at least with how far the technology is, is developed, is that it might help us be able to say, discern patterns. If, we, if we're recording our coaching sessions or something like that, and we want to go back and, and, and look for patterns that maybe are not easily detectable um, by the human mind, a really rigorous chat GPT or, or you know, 
intelligence, artificial intelligence bot could maybe help us see patterns to detect sentiment, to detect ideas that are operating in the background that we're not consciously aware of, we might be able to use it that way at some point in time. I also think that for specific coaching functions, well, there's even some evidence to suggest that AI in general, not chat GPT, but AI in general can be just as, as effective as a human coach. So for example, there's an, an article recently published by Nikki Turblanche from um, South Africa who looked at human coaching versus AI bot coaching for uh, goal achievement. So this is a very particular part of the coaching process. It's not vision work, it's goal setting and goal attainment, goal striving. And that piece of work found that you know, after 10 months, you know, the, the, the bot lagged behind a human coach for the first 10 months, but after 10 months, the efficacy between a chat bot <laughs> and a human being merged. Uh, and so there, I think it's, I think our opportunity is, and I, I don't begin to know how, but our opportunity is to think, how can we integrate some of this intelligence into our work so that we can do the more sophisticated thought work as human coaches and rely on the technology to enhance our practices? Yeah, I couldn't agree. I mean, I think we have no choice but to integrate and to try and embrace this as best we can. I think anyone who's going to repudiate this technology as being antithetical to you know, the coaching practice, just, just simply on the basis that it's not a human doing the work, I suspect, you know, best case scenario, they're just going to get left behind, you know, worst case scenario, they, they really are not going to be active participants in the future of coaching, you know, like, like, we, we might wish it to be otherwise, but I suspect, you know, the trajectory is only moving in one direction. It's not like this technology is all of a sudden going to stop and start getting worse at, you know, doing what you just described or whatever, it's only going to get better, right? So, we have to think of a way of, of, of integrating it within the human sphere of coaching. I mean, what, what I would sort of, the way I would look at it is, you know, if a client of mine, you know, punched in, I'm a 45 year old woman at such and such a point in my life, at such and such a juncture in my career, I do this, I don't do this, I want to do this and I don't want to do that, you know, yada, 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 put it, you know, because chat GPT can take quite a lot of input at this point, if you were to put that out and say, you know, make me a 10 year development plan or make me a five year development plan in lieu of a, co a coach actually helping me craft one for myself, I would still encourage that person to get the second human opinion to, to, to be like, oh, all right, well, so an AI has got you all figured out. Like, has that AI, you know, you, you've given this AI some kind of like high level descriptive detail you know, or, or perhaps quite, um, quite specific descriptive detail about your life, but unquestionably, you haven't included everything. Unquestionably, it's probably missed a few things here and there. And so, you know, perhaps an example of how we, you know, integrate this technology with what we do is if people are going to use it to, you know, be kind of a soothsayer for their personal development, like a digital soothsayer to say, here's what the road ahead should look like. I would encourage those people to at least have one session with an actual coach say, hey, this is what ChatGPT told me, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And have a discussion from there. So, so ma 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 maybe there's a, a both and rather than either or that we need to, you know, philosophy that we need to look at and how we apply this technology. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, to, and be creative, you know, think about possibilities that, you know, this idea of here, write me a development plan. You know, that's kind of groundbreaking. I mean, who, who would think to do that yet? Right. You know, it's still, the chat GPT right now can't tease apart the ought self from the ideal self. It oh, can't nice. tease apart the, say, competing commitments that you have that get in the way of actually making the changes you want to see. It, you know, it, it's just not right. that sophisticated yet. So can it expedite the coaching process? Sure, I bet it can. But can it really replace a coach or do we need to be worried? No. I don't think at this point there would, at this point, I mean, who knows where this technology, we, we might be working beside holograms in the, in the future pretty soon, you know, robots may be in all of our offices. Um, but I think at this point, what the coaching industry should be doing is thinking about how do we leverage this along with human coaching rather than replace human coaching entirely. Absolutely. I mean, and just the last thing I'd say on that is I hadn't thought of that, but, but you know, the chat GPT certainly as it stands now really is like an ought self 
machine mm -hmm. you know it, it really it, it really is not going to see you know like like you would have to pump it with so much you know counterfactual information about like what the prospects for your future or the pathway for your future could look like for it to even remotely get near the ideal self right now otherwise it literally is going to be producing or self left right and center it's going to be you should be doing this you should be doing that no matter what you've thought about it i've thought about yeah. it and here's what i think <laughs> and i'm going to impose this on you and now it takes away yeah. the autonomy and competence that we know is important for sustained motivation so yeah i think there are certainly some drawbacks at this point yeah and and and, and the connectedness piece as well i mean I'm, just, I'm sure some people have a have a meaningful connection with their chat gpt but uh i suspect they are uh, probably in the uh minority but finally angie just the, the last question and, and thank you for being so generous with your time the, the last question i want to put to you is you know kind of actually continuing on with this theme, it's kind of a future centric spin on the first question I asked. So uh, just as a, again, as, as like a matter of personal opinion or individual reflection, are there any nascent or as yet unstudied aspects of coaching and, and, and coaching research that you think could be something really new or cool or, you know, potentially even groundbreaking in the future of coaching? Are, are there areas of coaching research that, that might be currently underexplored and maybe areas for which you think that they you know they could be the source of some really new and novel insights into coaching as its uh, scholarship and practice continues to improve yeah well i think i personally think that our we are still very nascent as a field and we like i said at the beginning we've made the most strides in outcomes research. And we still need to continue to do that work. But where the field, I think, needs to go is to look more deeply at the mechanisms that, you know, the how we achieve those outcomes. We need to understand better how context plays a role. We need to understand how characteristics of the coach and the coachee play a role. I think we're, you know, the space around coach competencies is really not well supported by research to understand like what do coaches actually need to know and be able to do to be effective. We have big questions around that. I think we have big questions around diversity, equity, inclusion that we can be asked around coaching. I recently was at a, a coaching conference, a practice conference where I was d touched by how many coaches resonated with their role uh, or potential role in climate change. And it made me start to think about you know, how do we scale up how we think about the impact coaching could have? So I would love to see more research related to, say, coaching and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. You know, how do, what role does coaching have to play in addressing poverty or hunger or climate change? Yeah. I think that's a wide open space. And then I think we've got to keep up with the field in terms of all the proliferation of types of coaching. So we've got now team coaching and peer coaching and group coaching and our science needs to to follow that and challenge some of the practice paradigms to see if they're you know do they really hold up when we apply rigorous scientific uh, study to those so in general I, I mean I think the field is wide open there are so many avenues for future research and those are just a few that I think will we will see more of as the field moves away from outcome studies and into more nuanced studies of, of coaching dynamics in general. And, and, isn't, and isn't just that prospect, just all the, you know, the, the prospect that there's so much more work still to be done and that can be done, that to me is really exciting. And that's what makes me so grateful that, you know, people like you are on the front lines doing this research, you know, it, 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 you know intimately engage with the latest findings so that we can continue to update and enhance this field that we care so much about. And, you know, uh, you, you said at the top of the show, you, you know, you, you give primacy to the idea of making this field as scientifically informed and scientifically rigorous and robust as it can be. And, you know, we, we really do need people in that role, you know, making sure that um, this field is not going to regress back into its, you know, dark sort of pre-scientific era where, you know, there were, there were diploma mills for coaching left, right and center and nothing was organized or standardized about it. It had no theoretical underpinnings. It had no empirical research to support it. So, I mean, just long may this trend of, you know, scientific enrichment of the coaching practice continue. And, you know, I, again, just so grateful that people like yourself are there to, to do that kind of work. 
Well, thanks for giving me a platform today to talk about it. I appreciate it. No, this has been really cool, Angie. I mean, again, it, it's been great to hear this all from someone who's so acquainted with the with the frontiers of research in this area and can pass such authoritative comment on it. But but more than anything, it's just been fabulous to connect with you again. And, yeah, um, likewise. I'm so grateful that you, you made the time to join me on the show. So my boundless gratitude to you and please just keep on doing all the wonderful work that you're doing. Likewise. Thank you. No worries. All right. Take care of yourself, Angie. We'll connect again soon. Sounds good. Bye, Gareth. Take care. Bye. Bye.